Welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast, made for women who want their healthiest years to be ahead of them, not behind them. Join your host, Courtney Townley, right now as she breaks down the fairy tale health story you have been chasing all of your life into sensible action steps and lasting change. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast. This is your host, Courtney Townley. So glad you're here. And before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to let you know that many of you have reached out to me through my DMs on social media, and you have emailed me about how much you like the Grace and Grit show. And I so immensely appreciate those messages. I really, really do. And it would be hugely helpful if, in addition to sending me that message, you would rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast from. Why is that important? Because I'm not the only one who reads it. Other people read the reviews and it's what inspires other people to listen to the show. And of course, my objective is to get this show into the ears of as many women as possible. And you can help me do that. So if you have the time, you have the desire, I would certainly appreciate it. And it does the show a ton of good. Now, today, I thought we would talk about healthy self-discipline. Self-discipline is actually a topic that I've covered on this show before. I've talked about it in a lot of different spaces and places, but I want to readdress it because there are so many interesting thoughts about self-discipline. And the truth of the matter is self-discipline is a really necessary part of any kind of change process because you know that to change behavior, you're going to have to rumble with discomfort. You're going to have to rumble with learning new skill sets. And that isn't always pleasant. It isn't always fun. And self-discipline is what allows us to keep showing up even in the face of those kinds of things. So I want to start with a few definitions of self-discipline. Google defines self-discipline as the ability to control one's feelings and overcome one's weaknesses, the ability to pursue what one thinks is right despite temptations to abandon it. I especially love that last part. (laughs) The ability to pursue what one thinks is right despite temptations to abandon it. Because to me, that speaks really beautifully into integrity. Integrity is standing strongly for what we believe, even though it would be so much easier sometimes, oftentimes, to abandon it. Because not not everybody agrees with us. Not everybody understands why we do the things that we do. It's not always easy. It's not always a clear, sunny day traveling on a nicely paved road. It's often, right, roads that have barely been used and lots of potholes and lots of difficult weather. That's what the journey looks like. So if we want to stay in integrity with ourselves, of course, self-discipline is a big part of that. The other definition I wanted to highlight in this episode is by Brooke Castillo. I think a lot of you know that I'm a certified coach through the Life Coach School. And she says that self-discipline is your ability to have self-control and restraint against base primitive desires. So what does that mean? Well, if you've listened to this show, you've heard me talk about the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, the amygdala being the older part of our brain that is very reactive. Its main objective is to keep us safe and to keep us alive. And so if the amygdala had its way, it would stay in the cave all day, eating bonbons, watching Netflix, (laughs) and not really do anything that required a lot of exertion that required you to get uncomfortable because the the amygdala really likes to pursue pleasure to exert the least amount of effort and to 
again, stay safe. So we self-discipline speaks to our ability to recognize that the amygdala, a part of our brain, is very reactive. And that's a wonderful thing, right? Because if a truck was about to hit you on the road, your reaction would be to jump out of the way. It definitely serves a purpose. And yet, if we don't acknowledge the high reactivity of the amygdala, it can also get us into a lot of trouble. Because seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, and exerting the least amount of effort is not a recipe for health. So we can't give all of our control over to that part of our brain. And then a third definition that really is just something that I came up with based on how I tend to view self-discipline is this. Self-discipline is knowing who you are and what you want for your life and managing yourself in a way that allows you to go after those things and stay focused on the way to getting there. And it probably comes as no surprise that if you've ever heard my definition of self-leadership, it's very similar. Self-discipline is a very powerful component of self-leadership. The things that you commit to consistently because of how they shape you in the future are disciplines. And again, I just want to reiterate that applying self-discipline in healthy ways, which is really what we're talking about today, is how we bring ourselves back into an integrity with ourselves. So let me just be clear that when I say talking about self-discipline in healthy ways, what does that mean? Well, self-discipline, like anything, can be used and abused. People can take it way too far to the point of self-destruction. But when people take self-discipline to the point of self-destruction, it's not coming from a healthy place. It's usually coming from a place of having to prove yourself, not feeling worthy and trying to get validation from other people. Where healthy self-discipline, I always say, is an extension of self-respect. It's an extension of self-love. So it makes a lot of sense that if you struggle with self-respect, if you struggle to like and certainly love yourself, you may be someone who struggles to apply self-discipline. The kind of self-discipline that I teach my students is a very kind thing to do (laughs) versus a mean thing to do. So a lot of us kind of revert back to our childhood and we think of discipline as punishment. That is not at all the type of discipline we're speaking to here. So the thing that really determines if self-discipline is helpful or harmful along the path to improved health is the why behind it. Why are you being disciplined? Is it because you don't think you're worthy unless you are? Is it because you're trying to prove your worth to the outside world? Is it because you have put your lovability into how you look? These are not healthy reasons for applying self-discipline. Healthy reasons for leaning into self-discipline are, again, things like knowing your worth, having respect for yourself, and this incredible life that you get to live, and wanting to shape that life in a way that makes you feel authentic and fully expressed. That pursuit is going to require a level of self discipline. Of course, consistency, which you've all heard me talk a lot about, is also baked into self discipline. 
we consistently show up for ourselves. That is a discipline. So what informs our self-discipline is knowing who you are committed to being in the world. What version of yourself do you want to express to the world? A lot of people don't have clarity on that. And so, of course, then they struggle to be disciplined. Clarity, I always say, is the mother of self-discipline. When we have clarity, it gets a lot easier to show up consistently for the things that will elevate our life to the place we want it to be. So who are you committed to being in the world? That's a great question to answer for yourself. And then second to that, what are the disciplines that will help you to stay in integrity with that version of yourself? So let's just say I am committed to being a woman who likes how she shows up in the world. Well, that might look like building a discipline, a practice of slowing down and pausing through the day to check in with myself and to make sure that I'm responding to the world around me rather than living in a space of high reactivity. Or maybe I'm committed to being a woman who is fully present in the moment. So in order to do that, I have the discipline of shutting off my phone when I'm with loved ones or working on important projects. So very often we think of discipline as an action, as something we do. And I do believe that discipline is that. Discipline absolutely can be an action. But I want to invite you to consider today that discipline, self-discipline, is, can also be an emotion. It can be a feeling that we generate. I think a very close cousin of the feeling of discipline could be motivation, right? And how often have you said to yourself, I just don't have motivation today. I just wasn't motivated to do the thing. I just didn't have the discipline to follow through. Here is the really cool thing about considering self-discipline as an emotion. And I know this isn't the norm, by the way. Like, I don't think you're going to find a lot of articles out there about viewing discipline as an emotion. But it's a really powerful thing to try on because emotions drive our behavior. How we feel is the reason we show up to do the things that we do. It's also the reason we don't show up to do certain things. So if you think about the benefits of feeling like a self-disciplined person, there's many. Think about all the moments in your life where you would describe yourself as being self-disciplined. What was the benefit on the other side of that? I bet there was a lot of benefit. And the beauty of thinking about self-discipline as an emotion is that emotions are something that you can generate. You have so much power in your emotional landscape. And if you want to generate more self-discipline, that is made possible by managing how you think. And some really helpful things, again, longtime listeners have probably heard these things before, but I'm going to mention them here because I think we all need as many reminders as we can get. And hopefully there's a lot of new ears on the show as well. So how do we think in a way that helps us to generate self-discipline? Well, we get very clear 
on why we want to become more self-disciplined in the first place. I call these your compelling reasons. And honestly, I see a lot of women getting clear on their compelling reasons maybe once a year. It's usually around the new year, right? They take an afternoon or an evening to really get clear on what they want for the year ahead, how they want to show up, the goals they want to achieve, and then that piece of paper or that journal gets put away and never opened again. Not helpful. What is helpful is getting clear on your compelling reasons and then reminding yourself of what those are every single day. And they might change. You might have to, you know, sort of mold them into something else as you try them on. They will evolve. They will grow. But if you're only visiting them one, a, once a time, one time a year, how is that helpful? And of course, we have the evidence that when people review their compelling reasons only one time a year, what happens? Well, by the time February rolls around, they're not disciplined anymore. They're not doing the things. Another way to generate self-discipline through your thinking is to remind yourself that this decision, this way of being was made out of love, not punishment. This is not something that you have to do. This is not a way of being that you absolutely have to take on. It's something you're choosing to do based on what you know about yourself, based on what you want for this life. It's a very loving thing to do. And of course, we can also generate self-discipline by reminding ourselves of the benefit on the other side. So rather than hyper-focusing on what the thing is in the moment that you have the urge to engage with, (laughs) what is the thing you want most? Inside of my Rumble and Rise community, we talk a lot about allowing urges. An urge is a feeling that you have multiple times a day to do something that is not really in alignment with what you said you wanted for your life. So rather than working on that work project, you have an urge to watch Netflix. Instead of eating that healthy meal you planned for yourself, you have an urge to order pizza. Instead of going to the gym at one o'clock like you planned, you have an urge to stay at your desk and work. We have urges all the time. And we have become a culture that has lost the art of allowing urges. Nothing catastrophic is going to happen if you allow an urge. In fact, I would argue that if you allow an urge, you're going to feel more empowered you're going to feel more confident on the other side of allowing the urge. And self-discipline, feeling that you are a disciplined person is going to help you allow urges. So I will say this, I have personally found for myself and I have seen this to be true of almost every woman I have ever worked with, that it is harder to do the work of generating emotions when we're chemically jacked and carrying a lot of emotional stress. So your capacity to lean in to self-discipline, to generate self-discipline, which really is the act of follow through, right? Your ability to do that is directly proportional to your willingness to manage limited resources like time, energy, and mental bandwidth. I'm sure every single person listening today has had the experience 
of having this rock solid, incredible plan for how you wanted to live your day at the start of your day. And then by noon, maybe three o'clock in the afternoon, certainly by the evening, you feel like you're starting to do a face plan. You're negotiating everything. And you're telling yourself stories that I'm just not a disciplined person. You don't have to believe that thought. It's just a thought. What might be more true is that I didn't manage my time, energy, and mental bandwidth today in a way that allowed me to continue to generate self-discipline. Your allostatic stress load is the total stress of your life. All the things in your life that act as stressors on your life. And everybody is probably well aware that there is a lot more than one form of stress. We often associate stress with mental stress, but there's also nutritional stress. There's also, you know, all kinds of physical stressors. There's relationship stressors. There's so many types of stress. And when your stress load is really heavy, or I always like to use the image of a bucket, stress being a bucket, if your stress bucket is super full on the verge of overflowing, it will absolutely interfere with the strength and endurance of your self-discipline muscle. You will feel less disciplined the more you are carrying in your life. And this is where we get into the all or nothing thinking, which again, I'm sure everybody listening can relate to. We either go all in or we tell ourselves stories that I can't do anything or it's not worth doing anything. Rather than adjusting our expectations of how much time, energy, and mental bandwidth we have, we just throw in the towel. So if you want to continue to generate the feeling of self-discipline, if you want to be able to consistently follow through with the promises that you make to yourself, you have got to get very real and honest about how much stress you are carrying, which by the way is dynamic, it's always changing. So you can't get rigidly attached to what this looks like because as stress loads change, so does your time and energy and mental bandwidth. The way you're using those things changes. So I want to offer you that it's very helpful to think of self-discipline as a dial. If you've ever done any courses of mine, you've, you've heard this analogy before. The more stress we have in our life, the more it makes sense that we would need to turn down the dial of how much self-discipline we can administer in our life. And the less stress that I have, in my life, the more ability I have to crank the dial of self-discipline up. But if you are someone who is expecting your level of self-discipline to be consistent all year long, regardless of what else is going on in your life, it can actually rob you of your health. So I always use the example of an athlete for this. If you look at an Olympic athlete and you look at their training protocol, nobody here will argue that Olympic athletes train really hard. We would all probably describe them as very disciplined people. And yet, their discipline is not constant all year long. And what I mean by that specifically is baked into their training model is periodization. What is periodization? It's cranking up the dial 
for a period of time. So they're training really hard. They're going all in. Their entire life is dedicated to training. And then after they compete, there are seasons where their training program is shaped to allow them to turn the dial of discipline down. Because if they continue to put as much energy as is required for a competitive event, if they applied that level of energy 365 days a year, they would cease to be athletes because they would self-combust. They would physiologically and psychologically break down. And so how do we apply this to our own lives? You may not be an Olympic athlete. I'm certainly not. But the concept of periodization, the concept of this discipline dial makes an awful lot of sense. So when I have periods of intense stress, I'll give you an example. A couple weeks ago, many of you know, I did the Consistency Code Crash Course, which a lot of energy goes into those kinds of events. I knew the event was coming. I've done events like this enough times to know that energetically and time-wise and mental bandwidth-wise, it requires a lot from me. And I'm totally cool with that because I know it's temporary. So I am able to give myself the grace of showing up in a more intense way in my business. And that also means I have to be willing to turn down the dial of self-discipline in other areas of my life. For example, my workouts during that week looked different. I wasn't lifting as heavy. I wasn't doing interval training. Does it mean I didn't work out that week? No. But I was doing a lot more active recovery because I knew that there was a lot more stress in my life that week. So I was trying to figure out ways that I could help regulate the total stress load of my life. And that required turning down the dial of discipline in other areas of my life. And what that allowed me to do is once the event was over, and it was over in a week, I was able to get back to my regularly scheduled program. But what I used to do is I used to run an event like that and also put on myself the expectation that I should be showing up in every area of my life exactly the same as I always had been. So my workouts should look the same. I should only need the same amount of sleep. I should, you know, still be spending as much time with my friends and family as I do when I don't have events like this. And because I was unwilling to turn down the dial of discipline in certain areas of my life, you know what happened? I got burnt out. I got sick. I would end up having to recover for weeks because I wasn't regulating my limited resources well. So just a few tips for you to keep self-discipline healthy in your life. You've got to stay honest about the total stress load you are carrying. If you're going through a major life event, You may have to turn down the dial of discipline in other areas of your life because it's a very healthy thing to do. When your stress load overflows, your body breaks down in a lot of ways, right? We know that stress is correlated with inflammation and inflammation, chronic inflammation is the precursor to disease. So stay honest about your total stress load. Stay honest that time, energy, and mental bandwidth are limited resources. Secondly, ditch the all-or-nothing thinking. The cool thing about thinking of self-discipline as a dial is that the dial never has to get turned off. You never have to completely shut down. I just have to turn it down, turn the volume down a little bit because of what else is going on in my life, or 
I turn the dial up. But I have found that, that visual to be so instrumental in helping me to ditch all or nothing thinking. There's always something I can do, but that something looks wildly different based on what else is going on in my life. Also, I mentioned it briefly earlier, practice constraint. Practice making hard choices. A hard choice is not saying no to something that you don't want to do. A hard choice is saying no to something that you do want to do. That's the hard choice. And a lot of women I work with, their life is full of things that they want to be doing. And yet, they're burning themselves out because there's too many things going on in their life. So they have to practice constraint. They have to scale back. They have to say no to something that they do want to say yes to, but it's not the biggest priority in the moment. So we use our value system as a filter to practice constraint. What is most important right now, this week, this day? And there are things that you would like to do that are not on that list. And are you willing to lean into the discomfort of saying no to those things? That's the real work. And then, of course, we have to parent our brain. Because there is stress. We all have stress. Life is stress. But then there's the way that we think about the stress in our lives. And the way we think about the stress in our lives can either really help us or hurt us. So if you are someone who has listened to the show today and you're like, ooh, yeah, this resonates. I want to learn how to do this. I need to learn how to do this. As always, I'm going to invite you to join the Rumble and Rise community, which is where we do a deep dive into these types of skill sets and so much more. You can find out details about Rumble and Rise by going to graceandgrit.com forward slash ready to rumble. If you have questions about it, you can always email me, Courtney at graceandgrit.com. But I hope this was helpful. I hope it allows you to think of self-discipline in a different way. And I hope it allows, reminds you of how much power you have to organize yourself in a way that allows you to apply self-discipline. But also I hope it reminds you that you have a lot of power in how you think about self-discipline. Thank you so much for being here. And I will see you again next week. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Grace and Grit podcast. It is time to mend the fabric of the female health story, and it starts with you taking radical responsibility for your own self-care. You are worth the effort, and with a little grace and grit, anything is possible.